Along the Mediterranean shore of eastern Spain lies Barcelona, one of the great cities of Europe to put high on your list of places to see. Although its sprawling metropolitan area is home to 4.2 million residents, you can easily see the main attractions of this country's second largest city in just a few days by walking through its square mile historic center. And be sure to see Barcelona's most famous building, Sagrada Familia, that fantasy church designed by the eccentric architectural genius Gaudi. It would be smart to spend most of your time in and around the old section of town called the Bari Gothic or Gothic Quarter, a giant pedestrian zone surviving from the ancient days. Barcelona has a large number of important historic sites and museums, shops and tourist destinations, but the best attraction for many visitors will simply be this large pedestrian district. It's perhaps the most extensive automobile-free district in all of Europe, except for Venice, which has no roads at all. In fact, Barcelona has been called Venice without the water. Of course, Barcelona has plenty of cars and trucks and buses on the busy big streets, but it's easy to get away from them. Indeed, one of the most enjoyable activities in Barcelona is, is simply taking a walk through these many narrow lanes away from the automobile traffic. The lanes wander and bend and curve like the maze of a travel mystery that leads to the overwhelming question, what's around the bend? Remember to look left and right as you pass the smaller alleys intersecting with the main lanes. And you don't need to walk down every one, but they are worth a glance and, and some of them might tempt you to probe into them into their depths. It's really a lot of fun. We'll be suggesting specific routes in this program, but you're always encouraged to go off on your own and deviate and follow what looks good at the moment, and then perhaps get back onto our suggested route later. The pattern of narrow streets has survived for over 2,000 years, ever since the city was first established by the ancient Romans who built a wall around what would later become the Gothic Quarter. And some of the street patterns that we see today were actually established way back then by those clever Romans. Their clustered town surrounded by the wall became what is the heart of today's Gothic Quarter. Even earlier, around 500 BC, the Phoenicians and Carthaginians created a harbor for merchants in this area. During the Middle Ages, the basic urban design was preserved and, and somehow in the following periods, let's say in the Renaissance and the Baroque times, not much happened in Barcelona. And even right up to the modern period, this Gothic quarter was basically ignored and neglected while the rest of the city developed around it, preserving this historic center by default. Now in recent decades, the city realized what a treasure they had with this intact medieval core, and they have done a great job renewing it to create the city's main attraction. You'll find that many of Barcelona's 35,000 stores are packed into this pedestrian zone. These are small independent boutiques in the traditional European manner, much different from the American system of having identical shops in every shopping mall. Barcelona's retail zone continues north beyond the Gothic Quarter along what is called the 5K shopping line, which amounts to about a three mile corridor extending along trendy wider boulevards, especially Passe Gracia. This more modern zone was developed from the late 19th century in the Modernista style, also called Modernisma. It's a richly decorated version of Art Nouveau architecture that developed in Barcelona as a means of expressing their Catalan identity. You have to understand that Barcelona is a bicultural city with influence of Spain, of course, and Catalonia mixed together freely, adding to the allure of this exotic place. Now, Catalan culture rose here during the 9th century 
and then it thrived during the next eight centuries in the independent kingdom of Catalonia. Its native language is surprisingly not a pure Spanish, but Catalan, which is kind of a mixture of French and Spanish that follows its own rules. And Barcelona has always had close ties with the rest of Europe. For example, while most of Spain was occupied by Muslims during the Middle Ages, this region was not, but it was allied with the Franks. France is very close to Barcelona. And these historic differences are flourishing today in Barcelona's exotic mix of cultures and styles after being repressed by Franco's dictatorship, which outlawed the local language and many customs all throughout the 1930s right up until the early 1970s. Now it's not too much of a stretch to say that the Barcelona residents consider themselves to be Catalan first and Spanish second. There's four TV stations that broadcast exclusively in the Catalan language and most of the street signs are also bilingual. Enough shops and restaurant workers speak a little bit of English for the visitor to get by just fine. So don't worry about having to learn to speak Catalan. Now Barcelona is such a cosmopolitan city that it has attracted a lot of foreign immigrants to come and live here. And the main source are coming, not surprisingly, from South America, especially from Ecuador and Peru, which together account for nearly one third of all the immigrants. Of course, Barcelona is a very popular city for tourists. especially with its convenient location near the border with France along the beautiful Mediterranean. The population of the urban core of the city is 1.7 million, with the 4 million people extending out into the broader metropolitan area. But most attractions are concentrated right in the one square mile of the historic center, making this a very easy city to explore. You could begin your explorations of Barcelona right in the main square at the center, which is Plaza de Catalunya, a large patch of greenery with trees and lawns and fountains and benches and flanked by two large department stores, El Corte Inglés and Fanac. Barcelona's modern shopping district is just north and the old town is just south. Plaza de Catalunya is a transit hub with several metro and commuter trains running underneath it and major bus stops all around it and with nine streets leading into it. You can catch the open top tour bus in front of Corte Inglés but you might hold off on that scenic ride until later after you've seen the heart of town on foot. Stroll from Catalunya just south along the famous Rambla a broad pedestrian promenade that extends from the southwest corner of the square and continues for three quarters of a mile down to the waterfront and it ends in a large column in honor of Columbus. The Rambla is Barcelona at its best and most famous, day and night, so plan to come back to this stretch many times during your visit. The Rambla is always busy with People walking along, stopping and chatting with their friends and neighbors. There's flower shops and newsstands and along the sides of the street you've got your bars and cafes and it's really alive with activity throughout the day and night, making this one of the top venues for strolling in all of Barcelona. And there's some excellent hotels along the Rambla and a variety of prices that offer some good choices for a central home base. One hotel here that we enjoyed is the Cidadine, which is part of a French hotel chain. And they are somewhat unique in that they are an apartment hotel where you have pretty good prices, a very nice breakfast included with the room rate. It's nice and clean and modern. And many of the rooms are set back from the main road very quiet, very comfortable here. And being an apartment hotel, they have a little kitchenette in the room and they do not give you daily maid service. So there's 
uh, cost savings involved there that's reflected in their reasonable prices. We also found the Hotel Cologne to be an excellent hotel. It's a four-star hotel facing the cathedral right in the heart of the Gothic Quarter, a few blocks over from Ramla, and we'll get you there in a little bit in the program once we get over to the cathedral, which is coming right up. Now, there's a lot of lanes that extend out from the Rambla into the old town, and nearly all of these are for pedestrians only, so you can just take the plunge. Rather than walking the entire length of the Rambla straight down to the waterfront, you might detour into the Gothic Quarter and explore this gold mine of little lanes. Half the fun of this experience really is just wandering around and getting a little bit lost, although it's always helpful to have a map and a general itinerary for guidance. And so that's what we'll be doing in our program, is pointing out the main sites that you want to be sure to cover and showing you how to get there in an organized way along this network of lanes, while at the same time encouraging you to freely detour off on your own at any point around any corner that looks interesting at the moment. You can follow your own instincts and have a great time exploring this city because the walking paths are so continuous and the zone is so compact that you really can't get very lost. An excellent place to turn east from the Rambla is a pedestrian lane that's called Carrer de la Puerta Ferisa and it's lined with fascinating shops and old buildings it leads to a small strategic intersection where you'll probably end up several times during your wanderings because the three directions coming out from this intersection bring you to three of the major destinations of town. The Cathedral, the Plaza de Pi, and the Broad Angel Shopping Street. Now, the Cathedral naturally is in the center of the oldest section of town. Here you very typically will find a Gothic cathedral in many of the ancient European towns, and that's certainly the case here in Barcelona. The Cathedral de Seu, or they would say Catedral, was first built in the 13th through 15th centuries in the traditional Gothic style with a soaring nave and pointed arches, very tall columns with 28 side chapels, and there's a really interesting cloister that's home to a flock of noisy geese with an attitude. Nobody knows quite where these geese came from, but they've been here for centuries and are said to represent purity, fitting right in with the atmosphere of this wonderful church. The geese also served an important function they were like guardians warning against intruders and thieves. Now they are one of the hidden joys of Barcelona. You can also take a ride up the elevator and venture outdoors onto the roof of the cathedral for a stunning view across the center of town. And that'll help orient you for the walks to come and just give you some great shots for your camera. This prime location uh, top a low hill was an earlier home of a Roman temple and then in the 6th century a uh, church was built here. So it's no wonder that the narrow lanes immediately adjacent are dense with historic structures and small plazas. Standing in front of the cathedral on Plaza de la Seu you're flanked by two medieval structures. Pia Almuina on the left had been a monk's residence and then an Alms house that was feeding the poor, and it's now open as the diocesan museum with medieval religious treasures and changing exhibits. And on the right side of the cathedral, there's the fascinating Archdeacon's Palace, Casa del Adriaca, worthy of much closer examination. Looking from the outside, you can see that the Archdeacon's Palace is flanked by two fortified towers that were part of the original Roman wall. Now walk around to the entrance of the Archdeacon's Palace and here you'll notice an elaborate mailbox 
with an incised carving of flying birds and a turtle, symbolizing how fast the male should travel, but how slowly it actually moves. And this also refers to the wheels of justice for uh, at one point here in the 19th century, this building was home to legal offices. Now walk into the patio of the Archdeacon's Palace to enjoy the quiet cloister atmosphere with a beautiful fountain in the middle and arcaded columns all around. And there's a palm tree growing in the center that's a hundred years old. You're also free to walk inside the building into the lobby area at least, and there you can see the original ancient Roman wall. Dates back to at least the year 400 AD. Now naturally, the cathedral itself is right in the heart of the old town, and so there are some lovely strolls to be enjoyed all around it during the day and as well as at night. Uh, many of the shops and restaurants are clustered in the nearby blocks, and there's lots of people out for a stroll, and. There are probably several sidewalk musicians providing entertainment. For another taste of history, you might visit the Museum Frederick Marez on Carrer Comtes, or at least walk into its magnificent patio surrounded by a loggia arcade. This private museum contains religious sculpture from the Romanesque through the Renaissance, along with household items from the late 19th century. One block east of the cathedral, you're going to find the former home of the kings and queens, the Palau Royal, or the Royal Palace, which is now a history museum, the Museo de Historia de la Ciudad. In 1493, Columbus reported his great discovery to Ferdinand and Isabella in the palace's spectacular banqueting hall, the Salo del Tinel whose roof is formed by the largest medieval stone arches in all of Europe. Don't leave the museum just yet because there's a more ancient world waiting for you just below street level. It's where you can see foundations of buildings that once were houses and wineries, bakeries, leather factories, and fortified towers. The smooth paving of these streets and sewers attests to the ancient Roman engineering skills, which created some of the world's most sophisticated cities in those days of long ago. Now, if you don't want to pay to go inside, you can just peek in a few of the windows to see a little bit of the underground remains, and then you might visit the gift shop to look at pictures of the site and perhaps buy some souvenirs. There's also Roman ruins visible at street level just around the corner on Carrer de Paradis, it's in a little patio, and here you'll see four Corinthian columns that are still standing from the ancient temple of Augustus, dating back to the first century. And there's also traces of Roman wall a few blocks away uh, along Carrer Tapineria. The principal Roman street intersection in the underground museum is the same approximate location today of a major plaza up above it, San Jauma. That's where the city hall and the regional Catalan parliament, the Palau de la Generalitat, face each other. This was originally the site of the ancient Roman Forum, which was the center of the Roman town. And now 2,000 years later, this is still a major center of activity, and there's actually nine streets leading out from this one plaza, and each of those streets is worthy of exploring on foot and having a look at. The many people walking about here make a good audience always for the buskers, those sidewalk entertainers who rely on tips for their income. When you hear some decent sounds, be sure to just stop a while and linger, listen to the magical ambience, and then don't forget to drop a few coins. We heard this fellow in the evening making beautiful music just using glasses filled with water.
Carrera de Ferran is the main road running through San Jauma. And while there's some cars allowed on the street, it's mostly for pedestrians. And it's really the busiest street of the entire Gothic quarter, with lots of shops and restaurants along both sides and numerous side alleys extending out to form one of the town's best networks of lanes to explore. And this area can provide an excellent focus for the next major portion of your walking tour, for this neighborhood is filled with the throngs of people drawn to the many restaurants and to the little shops that stay open till 8 o'clock at night or 9 o'clock. A lot of them close during the afternoons for siesta, but they all stay open at night. This dense labyrinth of attractive alleys is bracketed by another major pedestrian lane that also passes through Plaza de San Jauma, and it runs roughly parallel to Carrera de Ferran, extending out from the Rambla, where it's called Carrera de la Bocaria. And then it continues for about a mile all the way across the district. It, it changes names about eight different times and slightly changes directions as it winds all the way over to the Palace of Justice. And this makes another great route to explore, enhanced by detours into its various side alleys and little plazas. But rather than attempting to walk the full length, of this eight-part street in one pass, you might find it more convenient to focus first on the network of lanes between Jauma and Rambla, and then cover the other half extending into the Ribera district later on, perhaps tomorrow. Nearly every little lane is worth exploring in the broad area bounded by San Jauma and the Rambla, and between Carrer Porta Ferisa and the Plaza Real the Royal Square. Uh, this is an area that's just filled with bustling shopping lanes and little plazas. There's a couple of churches, there's picturesque fountains, innumerable people, eateries, constant stream of locals going by, and it's all within this manageable quarter square mile package. Now because of this concentration of attractions, you could easily just meander through this section by turning this way and that and depending on what direction looks best at each corner, which could give you a totally satisfying experience. But to methodically cover it from one end to the other without missing anything, you could try following a little more organized route. And then maybe once you've covered the territory, well certainly then dive back in again for a rediscovery, perhaps in the evening when it takes on a different character. It's always filled with people shopping and at night, they're all heading for dinner at the nearby restaurants. Begin the methodical exploration in Place de Saint Jauma, facing the Parliament, and then take Carrere de Saint Honorat. That's the street that's just to the left side of the Parliament, and it soon leads you under a fancy pedestrian bridge that was built in 1928 in a neo-Gothic style, and it connects the Parliament with the palace of the Catalan president. After this bridge, turn left past the church of San Sever, whose elaborate Baroque altar can be seen through the glass of the locked front doors. You can't go in, but you're always welcome to stand outside the glass doors and have a look in at this beautiful gold altar. Next, you'll be passing the deluxe boutique hotel, the Neri, and then take the first ride into the small plaza of St. Philip Neri and drop anchor for a moment here to soak up this peaceful atmosphere, which contrasts with a violent role this space played during the 1930s Civil War when it was the scene of executions and skirmishes. Notice all the holes in the church facade that were blasted by bullets and bombs during that turbulent time and preserved now as a memorial. Plaza Neri is a little out of the way spot that most visitors would miss walking right past the entrance without seeing it's here, but you'll find that it's worth a visit. The Church of San Felipe Neri is one of the only significant Baroque buildings in Barcelona because during that time period, that's the 16th and 17th centuries, very little development was going on in the city. 
The 1500s began that period of great colonial expansion into the New World, which saw tremendous economic growth, where Spain was plundering a lot of the gold and riches of the New World and bringing back important food crops, sugar and tobacco. But for political reasons, this wealth was all directed towards Castile, which is in the central part of Spain and the southern part of Spain, around the port of Seville, not to Barcelona, which fell into a, a long period of economic decline as a result. Queen Isabella was supporting her home territory, which was Castile, to the exclusion of the Catalan area. Now that's a major reason why we have such a well-preserved Gothic town to enjoy today, since very little construction was taking place during that time, and ever since the Middle Ages in this central part of town, there have been very few changes. So we are blessed with this beautifully preserved Gothic old town. Now from Plaza Neri, walk a short block over to Carrer de Baris Nus. That's a, the former site of the Roman Wall, and it's now a very busy shopping street that's worthy of an extended stroll up and down its 300 yard length. It runs between the Plaza Nova and Carrer de Ferran. And then next, make your way over one block more to the Gothic church of Santa Maria del Pi and the three enchanting little plazas that are around it. This is another one of the great spaces of Barcelona that has it all. There's benches to rest, you've got trees for shade, outdoor cafes, there's shops, statues, and those little piazzas really create a, a wonderful atmosphere of spending some leisure time and enjoying the space here. And there's other major attractions within a few blocks, and all, it's all anchored by this most impressive church that has the world's largest round Gothic stained glass window. The impressive church interior features a high ceiling with Gothic vaulting and many stained glass windows all around, but otherwise the interior is rather plain because it was burned out during the Spanish Civil War. Now at night, these three little plazas are really lively with a lot of people sitting at the cafes or simply walking through. There's six little lanes that intersect here. The side plaza, of a Saint Oriol is especially busy with this popular restaurant, Taller de Tapas, and the nearby Maison Jesus, a simple restaurant with Catalan cuisine. And now you might zigzag through the little alley nexus that includes the main routes of Bocaria and Ferran, and the row of lanes in between them. And then you'll arrive quickly at the Grand Plaza of the Plaza Royale, that's the Royal Square. And this was built in the 19th century. It's surrounded by magnificent arcades on all sides and anchored by a grand fountain in the center. It also features some street lamps that were designed by Gaudi. Now, most notable among the restaurants here is a, a real phenomenon called Quince Nits. And people line up here for over an hour to get in for dinner and they're attracted by the low prices and the high quality and the skyrocketing fame of this amazing restaurant. Now one way to beat the line is to come for lunch, especially if you come for a late lunch arriving just before 3 p.m. to catch their last seating. Or you could eat at their other restaurant. It's called La Dulce Herminia and it's just as good and less crowded, but it is located about a half a mile away over near Via Laitana at 27 Magdalenas. And it also gets very busy, so if you're arriving for dinner, uh, be sure to get there just about 8 p.m. or you could call for a reservation. They have excellent food and really perfect service there. Another busy street, two blocks from Plaza Real towards San Jauma, is Carrer de Vigno. And that's a pleasure to stroll it during the day or at night. Uh, it's got more shops and restaurants, a real local kind of a hangout. This street is so typical of the narrow lanes that we've been showing you throughout Barcelona and the historic center. You can see it's largely for pedestrians. It's a place for walking, a place for strolling and enjoying the evening. 
and the street lights are on, the shop fronts are all lit up, only a few blocks off from the Rambla, and yet many people would miss it. The casual tourist would not even see this street, and too bad because they're missing out on really part of the essential Barcelona. We have many more movies about Barcelona in our collection. Be sure to look for them.